All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of Side Talk. Tonight, this is Side Talk. I'm here with um, Reverend David Chotka, and I'm so well, excited. Said, you got it right. <laughs> Yeah, we were just talking about pronoun pronouncing his name and guys, I got it right on the um, first try. So um, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Akisha, it's a joy and a delight to be with you. Thank you. So guys, I'm on camera tonight, even though I really don't want to be because you see I'm not like glammed up. I don't look, you know, all great. I just look like boring Keisha. So <laughs> but I'm doing it for the reverend, the good reverend. <laughs> Thank you very much for calling me a good reverend. <laughs> I hope it's completely true. Because <laughs> he looks great. He got all dressed up for you guys. So, you know, we had to like, you know, give him a little shine. So I want to ask you, did you always want to be a reverend? Um, if not, what was your path to this particular career that you are now in? Well, that's a that's a long and convoluted answer to that one. Uh, I mean, the point was, well, actually, I, I became a, a Christ follower in my teen years. Mm. And I was two years a believer when I had an unusual experience. So I was in my last year of high school. And I remember the moment I, I walked up to my dad and I said, oh, Dad, I, I don't know what I want to do with my life. And he said, well, your marks are all the same. I said, yeah, one or two percent. My marks are all the same. And I don't have a passion for one or the other. And then he looked at me with a twinkle in his eye and he said, well, have yourself a good sleep, Sonny. You'll know what to do in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so we laughed. I went to bed and I woke up the next day and I knew it was going to be a pastor. And so I walked into the high school, got a hold of a guidance counselor. And the guidance counselor uh, said, well, what's your denomination? And now down south, you don't have this denomination, but it would be like a combo of Methodist and Presbyterian. If you can imagine those two marrying and having a child, that's the group. <laughs> wow. At any rate, I was, I, I, I said, well, you know what? I'm not real fond of what I'm doing right now. I'm not real fond of my home church. Uh, and he said, why don't you go to my church? And my pastor has arrived, et cetera, et cetera. So he booked in and I got to see the guy the same day. And as it turned out, he was on the ordination committee for, for uh, that particular area. It's called a presbytery. And so I, I, he said, well, look, uh, you need to go back to your home church and you need to go through that church because they love you there. I said, hmm. <laughs> they said, well, you better do it. So I prayed about it, had this profound sense of peace come over me. And I went over to and the next day. I booked in to see the pastor and he was free. Usually it takes a week to get an appointment. And he looked at me and said, you're going into the ministry. I said, how did you know? He said, I, I just knew. I, I just I just am aware. I've been watching you. So I had no idea the guy was watching me. But the bottom line was within a week and a half, committees that usually would meet over a two-year window and drag the thing out over two years all got me st signed, sealed, stamped, and delivered. And I, it was done. I was, I, was in tr I was in process to train for being in the ministry. And so, so I saw my dad at the same refrigerator spot. And I said, he said, son, you know, we, two weeks ago, you went to bed. And we, we laugh. And, uh, have you decided what you're going to do? I said, yeah, dad, I'm going to be a pastor. And his jaw dropped and he started to sweat. And he looked at me and he said, oh, we have to talk. I said, okay, dad. <laughs> now, now, let me give you some background. My dad was a bouncer. His sister ran a strip joint. And that's the background. My parents, my dad got out of that and he wound up finding a restaurant and running some apartments, but that's the background. So all through this, it was pretty, you know, I was used to swearing and violence and unclean sexuality and all that kind of thing. Anyway, he, uh, we, we book in a time to see each other because I was on my way to something else. And I, I sat down with him and I said, uh, I said, uh, what happened, dad? And he broke it. He was an agnostic at this point in the game. When he was a little boy, he got kicked by a horse and he, he almost died. And his sister saved his life, got him to a hospital. And uh, she became kind of the hero of the family. And that's the one who ran the strip joint. So it was a crazy, confused kind of thing in my childhood. This was my hero, you know. So he lost most of his eyesight. He couldn't turn, he couldn't move his eyes back and forth. He had to turn his head and he had Coke bottle thick glasses, although he wasn't born that way. And so he grew up not believing that God was good because trouble had come, violence had happened. He suffered with disease, you know, and he suffered with his eye thing. He watched people really, really suffer who were good and kind and bad guys succeed, et cetera, et cetera. And so he just couldn't believe in a God who was good. And so 
struggled and he was an agnostic when this thing happened. So here's what happened. He went to bed and put his head on the pillow. And I went to bed and fell asleep quickly. And in the middle of the night, he woke and there was a vision of the risen Lord standing in the doorway of his bedroom. He walked over to him and said, go and wake your son, David, ask him what he's dreaming. Tell him that he's going to be a pastor, that he's going to write books, he's going to travel the earth, and that um, I have chosen him for that role. And so my father woke up, ran up the stairs to where I was. I have two brothers. I'm the middle child. And so he started to shake me awake, and I did not wake up. And then he came to himself. Of course, he's an agnostic. <laughs> so, he, so he says to himself, that was a crazy dream. I just, I just don't, that's the craziest dream. What am I doing in this room waking my kid? He needs to sleep. So he went back downstairs. He got himself back into bed, pulled the sheets up over himself, pondering what had happened. And the Lord reappeared to him. And this is the part of the story that you probably haven't heard anything like this before. The Lord grabbed him by the scruff of his pajamas, stood him to his feet and said, you did not wake your son. Go upstairs, wake him, ask him what he dreams, and then tell him what I told you. And my dad said, go away. <laughs> He said, no, go now. So he raced up the stairs. Now, remember, he was an agnostic, all right? And he's, he's racing up the stairs. And as he's there, he sh apparently shook me awake. And he said, uh, what are you dreaming? And apparently I said to him, I am with the Lord. He is showing me the countries I will speak in. I'm supposed to travel the earth. I'm supposed to write books. I'm supposed to become a pastor. And I'm supposed to, you know, do this and that kind of thing. And my dad said, well, what I saw in my vision is exactly what you, have, you saw. And that's exactly what Jesus is telling me to tell you. You're going to be a pastor. And so I woke up the next day and I went to see the guidance counselor. I met a pastor. And then the committees all met within a week and a half instead of two years. The thing was done and I was launched. And so began the beginning of this call to the ministry. Wow. Well, that that was, is it wasn't crazy. my idea. <laughs> in fact, nothing I have done in life that has succeeded was my idea. Right. <laughs> so, was, so, so when, so when you woke up the next day and your dad told you that. Uh, he you, didn't tell me until now after, I mean, after he told me that that happened to him. Yes. When, yeah. He told you like the next day, right? Yeah. He, well, he told me, no, it wasn't the next day. It was about two weeks after. Oh, okay. And then, and then when he, after I had gone through all the hoops, he had no idea that I'd done this. And then, then he was shocked, and this started him on a journey of uh, coming to faith in Christ. And it was a remarkable kind of a thing that led to his uh, finally crossing that threshold himself. But I mean, he he didn't know he was going to be the instrument to call me into the ministry. He wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer or something, right? None of this stuff where you're, you got your cap in your hand and you ask somebody to take up an offer. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so crazy. So, um, sorry, my stuff just fell. No problem. No problem. <laughs> okay, guys, you know, some technical difficulties right here, right now. All right. So what would you say has been the biggest struggle in your career as a pastor? If oh, you had my, to share. How about me? <laughs> you? Why you? Yes. Oh, there are seasons where I, my, my greatest enemy in the ministry is me. I kicked myself around the block so many times mm. for the times when I knew that I should have been doing one thing and I did another. But, you know, I mean, here's the reality, and you, you'll know this. Anybody who comes to a church is just as human as you or I are. And uh, when they come into the church, they come in as they are. And there has been a season, it's vanishing rapidly, but there has been a season where people would pretend that there's something that they're not. Mm. And uh, I don't see that very much anymore because we can't afford to put on, you know, put on appearances and pretend we're something that we're not. But th the hardest part is where you deal with what I call two-faced Christianity, where somebody says one thing and does another, where they tell you one thing and they, they lie through their teeth while they're telling you that they go and do something else. And here's what the gospel says. You got to forgive them. <laughs> you have to, you have to, you have to encourage them, you have to disciple, you have to strengthen them. And, you know, if you're dealing with somebody who has got their drugs talking or got their alcohol talking or got their addiction talking or they're dealing with a broken family relationship and they don't even know they're hurting their partner and they just, they just are totally unaware that they are in the middle of trying to, you know, figure out how to be warmly human when in th they think they are, but they're not. Then you go in the middle of that, you don't know who to believe, and it takes you six weeks to get the answer, and you discovered you made the wrong move or made the wrong counsel or whatever. Forgiving myself, 
for not knowing better. That's right. Pretty yeah. Uh, but the other side of it is sometimes people make really, really bad decisions. And sometimes church communities, church organizations do things that are terrible stumbling blocks to believing. Like today, there was an article that there's, there's, there's this thing that came out with the Catholic Church in France. And hundreds of thousands of children were abused by Catholic priests. Yeah, I, saw I mean, that. this is terrible. You just, you know, so what does it do when you're trying to be a forthright servant of what is called the good and the right and the true and the just, and you're dealing with slime buckets who are abusing, you know, little boys or girls and, and the bishop covers his rear end and puts him back inside another parish and he does it again. I mean, that's, there's a good reason why people get jaded. So I don't know if I'm answering your question fairly, but I'm aware that when you de- that there's this there's these twofold things. One is everybody's human, and let's cut them some slack. That's the one thing. The other is um, the institution has shielded sin, shielded injustice, shielded unrighteousness. And so, how do you bring those two pieces together? How do you bring the fact that the church is made up of people who are broken and fallen and hurting, just like everybody else? And oh, by the way, you're being idiots together. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know how to fix that. I just know that to, to be a Christ follower, to be a believer, is to bear the consequences of both. And what I, the, my best solution to this is just simply to be myself and admit the thing, rather than try and pretend that the church is something that it's not, or that or that organization over there is something that it's not. Far better served to admit that people are just human beings who are attempting to understand how they worship the divine, how they come in contact with God. And I can just tell you this. I mean, I've had these amazing experiences of the power of the Lord intervene. And I didn't try and do that at all. <laughs> it was just something that God did, you know, and including that the way that I wound up on your podcast. I mean, I wasn't trying to do that. I yeah. was talking, you know, I was talking to the, the, the company that was doing this. And the next thing you know, I get this invite and I meet you and here I am in your program. Isn't but it wasn't funny? my idea. It was... <laughs> Yeah, God brought us together. Yes. So I, I guess I am being, um, you know, I'm, I'm experiencing some divine intervention, even though yes, you are. Sometimes I'm always like, well, where's my stuff? <laughs> well, the fact that we're the fact that we're talking together, yeah, is God's stuff. Yeah, exactly. So, what would you say is the biggest misconception about who a reverend is and what their lives are like? And I think you kind of touched on a little bit of that just a few minutes ago. But if you had to like delve a little bit deeper, what do you think the biggest misconception is? Well, that we're paper saints, and it's not true. I mean, I'm married. I got two kids. Sometimes, you know, I, I I was just in North Carolina at the Billy Graham Museum, and there was this interview with Billy Graham's wife. And the interviewer said to Billy Graham's wife, have you ever considered divorce because your husband's away so much? And she looked at him and said, divorce? No. Murder. Yes, murder. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the reason why everybody in the room laughed was because it's the, the Joe or Jane Average pastor is just like everybody else. The thing that's different is we're saved by grace. We've been called into this magnificent opportunity to proclaim that God is somebody who heals and delivers. And if you read scripture, oh my heavens, King David was a murderer and an adulterer. And Moses committed murder before he ran away as an exile out of his country. And he was a has-been when God spoke to him, told him, go back. <laughs> right? he, was, he was 80. And he actually says to God, uh, I don't know how to speak. And, oh, why'd you pick somebody else? You know, that kind of thing. So, I mean, <laughs> and, you know, when you look at Paul, Paul was on his way to kill somebody. When God appeared to Paul and he hit the ground, he was struck blind. And then this poor guy named Ananias had to go and pray for the jerk. And he was terrified out of his ever loving tree because guys like him killed guys like him. And so you have people in the scripture and actually people in current culture who come to the ministry as very, very, very much fallen, broken people, just like everybody else. And to be a paper saint is false. It's absolutely, completely, totally false. But I have no idea what those three people in the second row from the left are thinking about who I am. (laughs) Maybe they want me to be something that I'm not. Right. The other other thing that's really hard is that um, people assume that if you're the pastor, you can be called at two o'clock in the morning, and then you have to get to a meeting at six for breakfast, and then you're going to be doing your sermon at noon. 
And oh, by the way, you're going to go to hospital visits at 12 o'clock, uh, 1230. And then that's going to be followed by going out to tea with the ladies luncheon group. See, And then once you're done all that, they can call you whenever you want. You don't have an ordinary life. I mean, that's the other side of the equation. And they don't pay you enough. You never have enough because they say you're doing it for God. How come you want money? And so there's these funny kind of angles that are attached to this. Now, uh, I, I am, I'm a pastor in the Christian Missionary Alliance, and they do have a decent standard of pay, so I want to be clear here. But I do know lots of pastors are what I call bivocational. They're doing a job. Oh, actually, just like you. You work as an ID person in the day, and you do the podcast at night. You're probably tired when you get up in the morning. <laughs> Yes, guys. And that's why I look like this right now, because I've been working all day and not really time to be glamming up. Well, you look better than I do. <laughs> I'll I mean, take it. No, no. So, so here, here's the reality for a lot of pastors. Most churches are under 100, most of them. And so you got a pastor who can't quite make the, the, the church can't quite pay him, but he knows he's called. And so if his wife works and they get a secondary income, that's helpful. Or if, if she, in this case, she has female pastors whose husband work. They have the same thing going on. And what you have is always never quite enough. And that's a real struggle because when you go to the fundraiser banquet, you have to dress up. <laughs> you don't have the money to put in the fundraiser. So there's all kinds of aspects to being a pastor that are strange and odd. And I, the only way, the only way to diffuse all of that is to just be yourself and laugh at your foibles. And if you could succeed in doing that, it disarms all of the all of the stereotypes, you know. I love yeah. to laugh. I love to laugh. <laughs> you probably yes. noticed that. Laughter is good for the soul. I enjoy laughing too. I like to just be happy and, you know, just have a good time and take it easy. Like, I, I like that too. Yep. So you wrote a book entitled Healing Prayer is God's Idea. Yes. How did you become so passionate about healing prayer? Because I know that you pray, right? But yes. healing prayer is a different thing. Yes, I'll show you the book. So this, this is the book. I did write, write it myself. It's a co-write. Mm -hmm. And it's a co-write with a famous Methodist guy from the U.S. He lives in Memphis. His name is Maxi Dunham. And uh, this book came out this year in May. And uh, it's uh, uh, the first story in the book actually describes how it happened. And it, here's the reality. Um, there are not very many books out there or there are not very many positive models out there that teach Georgie an average pastor how to come alongside somebody who's sick and pray that God would heal them. In fact, the fear is if you pray and they don't get healed, it's going to wound their faith, right? And I, I just, I didn't know how to do it, you know, but I, I remember the moment where this happened and I think I told you this story in our interview. So here's what happened. I was in a seminary and some of the profs in that seminary were held convictions that were what I call anti-supernaturals. They didn't believe that Jesus actually did those miracles, but the church wrote something back on the lips of Jesus and all that kind of thing. And I believe, I believe that Jesus walked on water and that Moses, you know, uh, and that Moses split the sea, you know, that kind of thing. And I believe they're historical events. And so I would be in a class and I'd say something to this effect. And there was a student on the other side of the room who would, he was a magnificent humorist. And if I said anything to defend the historicity of that event, or say this is a gospel fact or something, the guy would tell a joke. Everybody in the room would explode in laughter, but I was the butt of the joke. And after a while, you know, it hurt. And so I just started to avoid the guy. And um, he had a beautiful, lovely wife named, uh, I, I better not say the name because we're on we're a podcast. <laughs> anyway, yeah. he had a lovely wife. And we, we had a common friend the common friend, I'm going to call her Susie because I call her Susie in the book. And I've lost track of her now because this is a 30-year-old story. But regardless, we had this common friend. And whenever I was around the common friend or with he, when he was his wife, there were none of those nasty attack jokes. Whenever I was in a class where I would defend the historicity of the scripture or say that, you know, the blood of Jesus was effective to save us from our sins or whatever, this humor thing would go off and I would wind up getting, getting caught in the crossfire. So I just, it was okay to be around them when, she, when they were there. It wasn't okay to be around him when nobody else was around. And so I just said, he's never going to be my friend. It's not going to happen. Let's just leave this alone. I'll do my class. I'll, I'll keep my head down, <laughs> that kind of thing. Anyway, one day I was crossing a plaza to get myself to a class. And Susie sees me. She walks up and she says, hey, David, how you doing? I said, oh, Susie, I'm good. How about you? She said, fine. I just need to tell you. Our friend's in the hospital. And Keisha, I did not feel bad. 
you know, <laughs> I'm admitting it. There was this passing moment of aha, you know, kind of thing. And then I realized that was a bad attitude. And then I said, oh, what's wrong? And then she said, he has phlebitis. And I don't know if you know what that is. It's where you get a, an embolism in your arm or your leg. It's called deep vein thrombosis in your leg. And it's called mm. phlebitis in your arm. If you get your vein filled up with a clot and the clot breaks free, it can land in your lung or in your brain. And 95 times out of 100, that'll kill you. And so it's a very serious thing, very serious. And so this girl told me that, uh, that, uh, that this man had this problem. And so I said, oh, that's too bad. And then she said something that just blew me out of the water. She said, well, he wants you to come to the hospital and pray for him. Well, well, well. <laughs> well, I said, I'm not going. <laughs> and she said, why not? I said, well, because every time I say anything about the Bible being true, this guy tells a terrible joke. I wind up laughing and then it hurts and I don't want to be around him. And she looked at me and she, she's a, re, this is a really sweet, kind, gentle person. And she looked at me and she said, what you're saying is completely true. I'm going to talk to him. I said, well, whether you talk to him or whether you don't, I'm not going. And so the next day I was in the coffee lounge inside the school and there she was, Susie again, she walks up to me and she says, uh, did you go? I said, no, uh, no, I'm not going. And she said, well, you know what? I went to see him and I told him that he'd been cruel and he cried and told me he was sorry and he wants you to go and pray for him. And I said, I'm not going. <laughs> she said, well, he's waiting for you. This is two times. Actually, I named two times in the book, but really it was three. So the, the third time I was in the same plaza we'd met the first time. And I'm walking across the plaza. And there she is. She raised over and said, David, did you go and see him? And I said, I'm not going. And I this, this was a sweet, kind, gentle, do unto others as you would have them do unto you kind of lady. And she stomped her feet. She got fire in her eyes. She stared at me and she said, David R. Chotka, aren't you going around telling everybody the Bible is the word of God and it should be obeyed? I said, yes. And she said, well, how about this scripture? I was sick and you visited me. And suddenly, Keisha, suddenly a fell blow landed in my heart. <laughs> I knew I was going to have to go and see the guy. And I, I didn't want to, but Bible's the Bible. You have to obey what it says. So <laughs> I went up to see him. Like half an hour later, I was there. And I walked in the room and he's hooked up to all these monitors and, you know, why, you know, drips are going into him and he's got this stuff on him to check his pulse and everything. It was very serious. He was pale as a ghost. And I thought to myself, the text doesn't say I was sick and you prayed for me. The text says I was sick and you visited me. <laughs> <laughs> now there were two things going on. One, I didn't think he believed. Two, I had never met anybody not once in my life who Jesus had healed. Thirdly, I had never ever been trained to do anything like that. I didn't know what I was doing. So one was scared out of every love and tree because of the guy making fun of me and turning me into a laughing stock. And two is scared out of every loving tree because I had not a sweet clue what to do. <laughs> right. So, but I mean, so I go in this room and I know I have to visit him because the Bible says I have to visit him, right? And my heart is pounding and I look at him and I said, look, before we do anything else, I just have to know one thing. Why, after you made fun of my faith over and over and over again in front of our peers, do you want me to even show up in the room with you? Why do you want me to pray for you? And he started, this man, grown man, started to cry. And as he was crying, he just, he just said, I am so, so sorry I did that to you. And then he said this. You're the only person I know who believes that every word in the book is true. Won't you please pray that the Lord heal me? I have a and I could die. And he started to cry. And I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, you, this is a man who now has said, I was wrong. And you, and I, you know that you believe the scripture is true. I don't know anybody else. Would you please do this? And so I realized that I had to. So I was now, you got to know, I did not know what to do. <laughs> so I, I walked over to his bed and I remembered in the gospels, Jesus put his hand on people. And so I said, um, can I put my hand on you? He said, 
okay. Uh, and where I said, where's the phlebitis? He said, left arm, just above the elbow. So I put my hand there. I put my other hand on his head. And then I started to pray. And I cannot remember a word I said. All that I can tell you is that it was an honest prayer. And I was trying to make it up as I was going along, but I was asking God to make him well and for the Lord's power to touch him. And then the most amazing thing happened. My being started to fill up with this sense of presence and fire and conviction. It's the only way I can describe it. It's like a velvety smooth assurance of warmth on fire with a focus on getting that man healed. And the room, the atmosphere, it seemed like it filled with faith filled with fire the whole room and I put my as I was praying I could feel that fire go down my arm and it went into his arm and then he said what is that fiery presence I said that's the power of the Holy Spirit that's that's Jesus spirit touching you he's healing you and then I ran out of the room <laughs> because I was scared he was going to mock me or I was scared that what I had said wasn't true because I'd never seen it, ever done before. I didn't know what I was doing. And I ran by a nurse who was walking into the room and I found out later on, the nurse was going in and he said to the nurse, I can go home now because my friend from the Bible college came and prayed for me. And of course the nurse said, well, we don't do that around here. You got to have some tests. And by the way, you're due. And so they rolled him down the hall and they ran a series of tests. Every trace of phlebitis was gone from his body. Every trace of it. I saw him the next day in the coffee lounge. And I, I said, you're here. And, he, and it, we were in a 19th century building with these fluted columns in the hallway. You know, we get these pieces of concrete that are decorated. And you could, there's little niches. And he pulled me into one of those niches. <laughs> and he looked around in every direction. And then he said, that prayer changed my life and what he didn't know was that prayer changed my life too and from that point forward I started to have these unusual experiences of presence when I was in, when I was next to somebody who was asking me to do prayer for healing now I didn't try to oh do oh my gosh that's so crazy so I just want to stop you right there so my cousin has a friend who is also um a pastor and she was doing a, you know, she was speaking somewhere. And my cousin said, all of a sudden, she took off her shoes and she was like limping or something. And she's like, someone in here needs me to pray for them for this, you know, this hip or whatever, like somebody here, like, please show yourself, like reveal yourself because this is like really bothering me. Yeah. And my cousin was like, she was like, floored because she never saw her friend, you know, do this before. And her friend was saying after the, the, you know, the sermon or whatever, her friend told her that she would have these random, like things just happen to her, or, like pains in certain areas. And it was like, she needed to pray for someone who was in pain in that particular area. So the, you saying this is just like validation of what I've heard, but, oh my God, continue. Well, no. So this actually, this, this, my wife had that very thing you described. So uh, the girl that I married wound up coming to an event in my church in Northern, in those days, it was in Northern Alberta, a little town called Lac La Biche. It's not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. <laughs> actually, the road ends in Lac La Biche, little town of 2,500. And I was pastoring the equipment, it was Methodist church up there, became what called the United Church of Canada, I told you. Anyway, we we're having a renewal event. And we brought in people to do the renewal event and they were all sharing their different stories of faith and what, what it was they believed and what had happened to them. And there was a very, very famous uh, lady. I won't tell you the name because um, I haven't asked her if I can tell the story, but, but uh, this girl who was going to become my wife two years later, um, she was sitting behind this lady. And while she was sitting behind it, I was standing at the front explaining how different gifts of the spirit work. And I was saying, oh, by the way, here are some signals that you know you're hearing the voice of God. I said, you, a scripture will pop into your brain. You'll sense the presence of the Lord increase inside of you. But I didn't describe what you just did and what I just did, the sympathetic pain thing, where you feel something in your body and then you find yourself prompted to pray. What I now know is that that is one method that God uses to impart to another the burden to pray for another person. But she didn't know this, and I was just learning this, but she was sitting behind this presenter, and while she, and, and then I said to the crowd, and it was, the congregation was there, and we were teaching this renewal event, 
So I said, look, if you have any questions, you can talk to any one of the team members or you can talk to me. I'm right here. I'm the pastor here. You know me. I've been around for a long time, et cetera. Anyway, she was in a small group with this lady and suddenly she got searing pain in her hip, searing pain. And she said, oh, this is really weird. That was not in the list. <laughs> what do I do with this? So she turns to the lady and she says, I just don't get it. I'm sitting here behind you. And as I look at you, I got this searing pain in my hip. What's that? And Lee looked at me and said, I am booked in for a hip transplant next week. I have been standing on the concrete floor and I am in excruciating pain and I'm unable to stand up to give the presentation. Would you please pray for me? And so this girl who had never done this before reached out and put her hand on the lady's hip and instantly the pain vanished. Wow. Now she stood up from there. She walked down the hall and there was a man with a migraine headache. And she didn't know, but she saw the man and she got this migraine headache. And she said, oh, I got this headache. And the guy said, oh, I have a terrible headache. Would you please pray for me? It was one of my parishioners. She reached out and touched his shoulder and boom, the headache vanished. And that went on for, you know, she, five or six of these things happened to her in that church. Oh my gosh, the poor lady. We eventually got married. <laughs> At any rate, um, the, the whole point of the healing prayer book is uh, I don't want people to not be trained about what I just told you. Right. And so the way that I met the co-author of this book, I, this is a very famous uh, co-author. He's written 47 books. This is his 48th book. And this is his very first ever co-write. He's never co-written a book before. And so we wound up meeting together by divine appointment. And that's a story by itself. And again, I didn't try to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but we started swapping stories and we both had accounts where we knew that we had to intercede for someone's mental, emotional, spiritual, or physical need. And we wanted to train churches to learn how to do this. So they didn't feel like, you know, a fool or something when they're trying to do this. And we have to unpack some of the mythology that's out there, some of the bad teaching that's out there. There's all kinds of bad teaching out there. And what, it, what we wanted to do was to create a manual to give churches the ability to be able to train teams of people to learn how to do this. And it doesn't have to be spooky. It doesn't have to be weird. It, it, it's, it's actually quite fabulous when it happens. So, so I'll tell you the one the most recent one. I, I'm sorry, oh, go ahead. No. Ask so I was going to ask you, do you believe in energy healers? And do you think that there's a connection between that? Well, I actually I listened to your podcast from last week. And so I yes. wondered uh, if you're going to ask that question. Uh, it's an open question for me. I do believe that, that there are energy fields around people. And I believe that all of us are fallen and broken. Okay, so there's this thing called the fall. And I also believe that this can be restored in Jesus who was the perfect one. And so I do believe that there is something to be said about that. In fact, I wound up preaching in Africa and you would see parallels between witchcraft and Christianity. Very often it would happen there. I wound up going to North Uganda. Uh, to help Uganda rebuild after the awful madness of Joseph Kony and after Idi Amin. And so my congregation went and did three, uh, three events in North Uganda and then one for the parliament of Uganda. And uh, that became, you know, a question mark when there were some iffy behaviors around the parliament of Uganda. So we had to withdraw from that. But regardless, I did see parallels, but they're not the same. Okay. And I do believe that Jesus is perfect. And uh, I can say this. I thought it was the Messiah for about three days, and then I resigned from the job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm considerably less than perfect, and so are the rest of humanity. But Jesus is perfect, and his Holy Spirit is perfect, and he bestows power to accomplish healing that is different from what you find inside a human. In fact, one of the most amazing things that you see in the Bible is, is the account of how Jesus says this bluntly. I can do nothing unless the Father shows me. And uh, it's, it's there after various healing miracles. One of the most amazing ones is in Luke 5, 17. It says a big crowd of people gathered. And there was a paralytic who came down through the roof. And so they had this guy that ripped the roof off. Nobody, by the way, nobody took up an offering to fix the roof. <laughs> so they bring this guy down. He's paralyzed. Jesus looks at him. And there's this interesting phrase. It says, the power of the Lord was present for him, that's Jesus, to perform healing. Now, park on that phrase. Here's what it means. That there were seasons where the power of the Lord 
was not present for him to perform healing. In other words, even Jesus of Nazareth in his earthly humanity, and I believe he was God, the son and the son of God, he entered into the human condition to restore what our first parents lost. And so when he was restored, he had to wait for the spirit of the Lord to guide him to do the things that our first parents were supposed to be able to do. Now, there is this thing called the fall. I don't know, you, you look really nice, but you're falling. <laughs> maybe, maybe I look really nice. I'm falling too. And we can't do these things in our own, or if we do them, we do them in a bent kind of broken manner. And we need the perfection of our Lord to carry us through to a different place. But I mean, I've been healed of a paralyzed face. My wife was healed of muscular dystrophy. And I have a doctor's note. I think I sent it to you. I have yeah. a doctor's note indicating that she no longer has the affliction. She couldn't grow muscle tissue and now she does. That tells me that something profound and powerful happened. Something really profound. It's in the book, by the way. It's the last story in the book. Does it drain your energy when oh, you no. do it? No. And that's what you're saying too. It's, it's, it's something that comes from God. And it's, yes. So when, yeah. when you're operating in a gift that God gives while you're doing it, the energy arises. Mm. If you're doing it in yourself, the energy drains. That's how, you know, you have a spiritual gift. See, right. God sends what he imparts. And as you are in that, you are lifted beyond yourself. And you're brought to a place where you can do things that you never imagined you could do. And wow. it's an amazing thing because you discover that you're an instrument for something that is astonishing beyond measure. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us, um, all right, medicine and miracle, the dilemma of deciding. So yeah. I know you got a, you got a hard stop at, you know, in 15 minutes, but I'm going to try to get we, all my we, questions in or we could do another interview if you want. Yeah. We might have to do a part two. <laughs> you know what? Look, you know what? Rather than try and grab a big topic and cram it into a few minutes, I'll give you a startup answer. If you, and if you want to go further with this, we could do another interview. Yeah. Let's do a part two. So okay. I, um, can start, I can start to answer that question. It's a large question. Yeah. All right. So, um, what are four kinds of prayers for? Oh, no, that's sorry. That's another question. Jeez. I'm, I'm over the place. <laughs> you want to talk about medicine and miracles? Is that what you want? Yes, to do? that's what I want to talk about. Medicine and okay, miracles. So like listen, when to, yeah. Yeah, there's a false dichotomy out there. There are, some, I'll just give you a partial answer today and we'll do another part two later. But um, the, there's, a, there's a partial, there's a strange kind of thinking out there that says, oh, if you're healed by Jesus, you don't need medicine. And oh, by the way, if you're healed by medicine, you don't need Jesus. <laughs> and, and what they are, and, and that could, I've seen this over and over and over again, there's an overlap. So there are things that science can do, and science is based on what you call empirical thought. You can see it, you can verify it, you have a thesis, you examine whether or not your thesis is true, your hypothesis, then you determine whether or not there's a logical outcome to what it is. And so this particular kind of antibiotic has this particular kind of effect on this particular kind of affliction, et cetera. And people dedicate their lives to doing this. And if they have done that, I think that's a gift from God too. But, so, but, but faith is in the realm of, of, of God intervening when it doesn't make any sense. And it transcends what science can do. And there, are, and, and there are seasons when you're face to face with the fact that someone's going to die, someone's in terrific trouble, and there is no medical solution. And so what you have to do is you have to attempt to pay heed to what you are sensing God is asking you to do in the moment. And sometimes the person's life is done. And sometimes there's a pathway to a remedy. And sometimes there is an, an instant miracle. And sometimes there's a combination of medicine and miracle working together. And sometimes there is, um, there is just, a, just an instant thing where, where there's this miraculous, astonishing uh, recovery. And uh, I, I live with this. So I have a son and a wife who are both healed of an affliction called FSH, muscular dystrophy. But I must tell you that for years, we accessed everything that science could offer. And, uh, right, and, but, and I have a daughter who has myotonic dystrophy. My daughter was not healed when my wife and my son were. And so I find myself accessing 
scientific endeavor and praying for the genome scientists to do something that's going to change that myotonic dystrophy. Even as I watch my son and my wife grow muscle tissue because the Lord Jesus healed them. And the miraculous thing in the middle of this was that uh, we had stopped praying for their healing. I mean, I can't, you know, if somebody you love can't lift her arms above her shoulders and has to grab her leg and pull it up so she grabs the handle to go up one stair, don't you think you're going to ask God to heal them? Of course Absolutely. you are. Well, we were in a house that had stairs and my wife was unable to lift her leg uh, up to walk upstairs. We were actually going to put the house on the market. When a Ugandan bishop came from that place where we had gone to help people in tribal Uganda to rebuild, they had had 20 years of war. And my church and two American congregations partnered together to go overseas to teach the people who were pastors. And we did work projects and we built a school and we built a, a library and we built a latrine for them, et cetera, et cetera. We did all those kinds of things. And I taught the pastors and I gave them a resource. Actually, it turned into another book that I wrote. I actually wrote this for the Ugandans. So this, this is the book here. It's called Power of Praying. And um, it's a book on the Lord's Prayer and uh, what the key words and teachings and phrases of the Lord's Prayer. And that's available on Amazon as, as my other one is. But I gave that to them as a training manual. We'd, we'd teach from it uh, as we went through it. But um, that bishop came to my church. And when he came to my church, he was preaching about the relationship between the army and 300,000 people praying to disempower Joseph Coney and his madness with child soldiers and horrible stuff. And everybody in the church was on the edge of their seats. It was this amazing kind of story. And as he's talking, he stopped. He had a very thick Ugandan accent, and it was hard to understand him. And the church was so full. It was a sanctuary that sat 400, and it was 650 people in there, shoulder to shoulder, up against the walls, because this guy was a tremendous orator. And he was telling about this tribal conflict and the war in the north part of Uganda and how Kony's army was defeated by 300,000 people praying. And in the middle of it, he stops, and nobody wanted him to stop because the story was spectacular. Anyway, when he preached, he spit. <laughs> I was getting baptized because I was right underneath him. He looked down at me and said, David, David, what is M.A.? I said, M.A., Master of Arts. I don't know. <laughs> he said, no, no, something's wrong. And he put his head in the pulpit. You know, everybody's waiting for him to finish the stories. He's, he's in the middle of this story. He stopped mid-sentence and asked me that question. I don't know how long he was, had his head in the pulpit, but he looked up and he said, it's a wasting muscle disease. <laughs> and it starts in the head and it goes down into the shoulders and down into the back. And when you damage a muscle, you lose it. Your face sags. You can't whistle your shoulder blades go out of position you start to be in chronic pain when you're 16 or 17 years of age he was describing my wife and my son's medical condition i was looking at her she had been unable to raise her arms higher than this for 30 years and he said whoever has this jesus has just healed you and her arms went straight up to the air for the first time in 30 years in front of 650 witnesses. I just about fell over. My jaw dropped. And then she went home and she started moving heavy objects and putting them on top shelves because we had guests in our house. Keisha, I, every morning she gets out of bed, I can't believe how good God is. He healed my wife. Now, did we access medicine? Yes. Did we appreciate the miracle? You better believe it. <laughs> Absolutely. And they're, they're parallel tracks and they're different. This one is based on what you cannot see. This one is based on what you can see. And there are seasons when they go like this. And there are seasons when they go like this. And I, in the next interview, what I'll do, I'm going to have to go in about two minutes. But in the next interview, I'll tell you how that medicine and miracle thing came into my spirit, because there was a whole bunch of people who said, if you do miracle, you can't do medicine. Or if you do medicine, you can't do miracle. A pox on both those houses is wrong. <laughs> it's just not All true. All right, David.